Good afternoon, everybody, um, or morning, depending on where you're at. Um, welcome to the first Model Aquatic Health Code Network webinar of 2017, titled Washington State's Approach to Regulating Flotation Tanks. Um, before we begin, there are just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you're viewing on your computer and you're dialed in through your phone line, please mute your computer speakers because you may experience some audio feedback. Um, also, if you're not dialed into the conference line and would prefer this method, um, please call the number that's on the screen um, and enter the passcode when prompted. Finally, all viewers will be muted during the call, so please submit your questions and comments through the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to use this and discuss topics amongst each other during today's webinar, but we'll save the Q&A portion towards the end. Um, and also, this webinar will be recorded and posted on the NATO MAC Network webpage, and a copy of today's slides are also available for download in the copy of today's slides um, or PowerPoint box on your screen. Um, so before we begin, I just have a couple of NATO updates. Um, NATO recently released a research brief called Pool Code Adoption Enforcement in Local Jurisdictions Model Aquatic Health Code. This document stemmed from local health department key informant interviews that were used to inform NATO and CDC of issues, successes, and challenges that health departments anticipated with MAC adoption. Um, so this research was used to identify best practices, um, technical assistance needs, and tools to help assist with MAC adoption or implementation. Um, so please also be sure to visit our MAC Network webpage, which houses all of the past NAC past MAC Network webinars and a plethora of, of other MAC resources, um, including the document that I just spoke about. Um, so if you want to, um, or if you have downloaded the PowerPoint for today, um, you can click both of those hyperlinks and it'll take you right to them. And as always, um, if you would like to be updated on future MAC Network webinars and other MAC um, updates, please be sure to register for the MAC Network by emailing macnet at nature.org. And I'll now hand it off to Doug Sackett from the Council for the Model Aquatic Health Code. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, I just had a, a few brief uh, updates before I turn it over to Paul for the presentation. So, Kelsey, next slide on that. Um, I wanted to remind folks that uh, the deadline for submitting change requests is coming up. It's midnight Eastern time, February 3rd, 2017. So if there's items in the MAC that you think need to be updated or new items, please uh, uh, submit a change request. You can see what's already been submitted on the website. We've totally redone things, so it's all electronic. So you can go to view the submitted CRs. I've got the, the uh, link there. And when you're viewing a, uh, a CR, you also have the uh, ability and opportunity to submit a, a comment, which will be linked to that, and that will be available for folks, for folks to see. But most importantly, if you've got information before the February 3rd deadline, the submitter can see the comments and has the opportunity to modify that change request based on information provided. And two other points is the technical review committees have been established. The technical review committee has been established, and you'll see the information and uh, the members and the content guidelines for that on the website, and also the seven technical support committees have been established, and you can see the websites that I have list, uh, web pages I have listed if you want to see more information on the membership on those two committees. And um, we've got our contact information on next slide, but we'll be getting uh, for you to remember if you do need to get in touch with us. And Kelsey, I'll turn it back over to you and or Paul. All right, I'll um, let Paul take the um, reins. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Kelsey. Thanks, Doug. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm, I, when I was listening to you all, I heard um, a little bit of like a clicking of feedback. So if I'm not sounding clear, please let me know. Um, so again, thanks to, uh, to the committee and the entire everybody on the, on the call. Thanks for allowing us to, to present what we've learned over the last three, four years. Um, on flotation systems. Um, my history, you know, I've been, I've been with aquatic, in the aquatics and attending the, these, um, the World Aquatic Health Conference for, for six or seven years. Um, when I came to Washington, flotation systems, or, or as they were called in our code, our code 
calls them sensory deprivation. But basically, they're specifically called out in our code as a special use pool. At that point, um, we didn't really fully understand how that fit into the rest of water recreation. Um, you know, come three and a half years ago or so, it was like we had to figure this out. So we tried to kind of boil it down to its basic components um, and really try to figure out what's going on with these systems. So it was, it was something that if it wasn't in our code, we maybe wouldn't have chosen to do it, but, but I don't want to minimize the fact that flotation is a very valid form of physical and mental therapy. Um, it's, not just, it's not just for the counterculture anymore. Um, it, it, this is a valid form of therapy. It's, a, it's been shown um, helping you know, pregnant women um, with, with pains and cramping and things like that, as well as PTSD um, patients as well. So, so it, it is a valid form. So basically, I'd like to kind of introduce what flotation systems are from our perspective. And I'm not able to advance my slides. Ah, thank you. Kelsey, if you did that, thank you very much. So flotation systems, again, um, They've, they've gone by several different monikers over the years. Sensory deprivation is probably the older one, um, but it's not completely accurate. Um, so the, the, basically the genesis of this whole thing came from a gentleman named John Lilly, um, doctor, um, physician, neuroscientist, uh, psychoanalyst, psychonaut, philosopher, writer, and inventor. Uh, you know, he, he envisioned this type of system um, to really help, help the body relax uh, and really get into a, a, a fully relaxed state and therefore get your brain to do the same thing. So, oops, next slide, please. Sweet. Okay, so this is some pictures of some of the early tanks. You can see um, basically folks were, were floating um, in, a, in a prone position as opposed to a supine, so the, their face was in the water as opposed to being out of the water. Um, obviously, to do that, you had to facilitate breathing. Um, so you had this big set of headgear on that was tight, and, and you know, those things make noise when they breathe. I don't know if you've ever been scuba diving, but you, there's always that noise. And again, you've got this big restrictive thing on your head, and you're supposed to be reducing stimulus, and that's just increasing it. So, so we devolved. Um, the compound in that water solution, um, I, can't, I can't say for sure. The one in the center almost appears to be more of a pool water just because of the way the person isn't super buoyant like you might be in the salt water. So I'm not quite sure. Um, but what, well, we'll get into what it's evolved into. So you can see um, very restrictive, uh, reportedly uncomfortable, I can only guess. Um, I would guess, it, again, in the, in the center tank, actually the one in the upper right, too, it would be hard to maintain temperature, too. So I would guess over an hour, hour and a half, that water is going to be chilly. So, so obviously there's room for improvement. Could we advance, please? Outstanding. Thank you. Okay, so this is the first commercially available flotation system for the general public. Um, it's called Samadhi. The Samadhi Tank Company was founded and still is run by uh, Mr. Glenn and Ms. Lee Perry. Um, they're in uh, uh, California. They were actually students and friends of Dr. Lilly's. So Dr. Lilly had his hand in developing this, this commercial, um, commercially available system. Um, again, it's, it's evolved a little bit. You know, the salt concentration has changed over time. Um, there's, there's pretty much from the beginning, Dr. Lilly has a book that was published in 1977 um, that acknowledges the fact that there are some skin conditions um, that can be transmitted through this water. So, so for quite some time, it's been known um, that some manner of disinfection needs to happen. We'll talk a little bit about the, you know, what, what pathogens we're really looking at because this, this solution tastes nasty. You don't get it in your water, you don't get it in your mouth on purpose. Um, so, so, so there's some, just some different uh, considerations. So again, this is a Samadhi tank. Um, actually, this is a, not even a brand new one because now some of the new ones 
have handles on the outside so when you're getting in with that high step over height, you're a little bit safer. Um, so we'll, we'll just kind of explore a few of the, the different styles. So advance, please. Okay, so we're just going to talk about a typical system. Um, again, there's all kinds of monikers um, throughout this and throughout with, with our state of Washington float system guidance. I'm going to try to be true to the, using the term float system. Please understand that's the same as a sensory deprivation, a float tank, a float cabin, a float pod. Um, I, I'm trying to loop them all into, under the same category. Typically, the systems we, we started looking at are for one person. Um, they do manufacture them for multiple people, but we're just trying to figure out the basics, so we're sticking with one person. Basically, it's, a, it's between 160 and 200 gallons of, of potable water, um, same as you'd put in a pool. But then you add to that 200 gallons of water, you add about 800 pounds of Epsom salt or magnesium sulfate. Um, obviously, you can see the picture on the right. You know, that's what the salt would look like in a pod if there wasn't water in it. It's a lot of salt. It's a lot of salt. Um, it's a very, very different solution physically and chemically um, after, this, after, the, after the salt is dissolved in it. That being said, the, the, you'll see down toward the bottom of this list, the, the float water is held at about 94.5 degrees. That's you know, within a degree or so. That's basically the temperature of your skin not your internal body temperature, but the temperature of your skin, where, where your skin is interfacing with the temperature of the water and the temperature of the air. So again, to kind of try to eliminate, you know, this is, this is the, the, the water part and this is the air part. You're, you're trying to minimize that. Uh, the industry preferred sanitizer, and I put that in uh, quotation marks just because um, people, people use the term differently, but that's, what, that's how we all use it. That uh, hydrogen peroxide is typically what the industry has used. <coughs> Excuse me. The system, um, as opposed to a traditional pool and spa that runs 24/7 essentially, unless it's being serviced, these systems, the circulation system, is shut down while the person is actually experiencing the treatment or the float, if you will. Um, if not, the circulation in these things is is very active, and somebody would be bouncing around in there like a ping pong ball in a, um, you know, a lottery game or something. Um, so, so that system is shut down. That being said, the water that remains in the filter, in the pump, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the engine. That water is going to cool down again. This the, with that salt concentration, we're at saturation at 94 and a half degrees. So as that starts to cool down, it's going to start precipitate. Um, it's a little bit hard on equipment. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, some systems, and I'm, I, don't, I do not know a percentage. Uh, oh, I missed one. Um, system runs between bathers, and we required four turnovers. I, I've seen some other um, literature today even um, that's talking about different turnovers. And, but for the state of Washington, we stuck with four turnovers to, to kind of stick with the traditional gauge bid well equation that um, is used, that's been used in the pool industry for 100 years or so. Some existing systems use UV or ozone systems as well as peroxide. <coughs> um, industry does not like chlorine or bromine because of the um, potential disinfection byproducts. And being a, an enclosed space, it's a valid concern in my opinion. Um, so going on to the pumps, again, with, with the salt starting to uh, re, it'll start coming out of solution in that pump. So in, one of the things to mitigate that is to use a magnetic drive pump as opposed to a direct drive pump. That helps with the, with the salt um, getting in, in there and, and harming things. Um, one, of the, one of the considerations with that is I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any NSF standard 50 listed magnetic drive pumps. Um, also, you'll see in some future pictures, um, traditionally these systems do not come with a hair and lint strainer. Um, also, most of these systems, um, actually all of these systems, don't have traditional skimming, where you have, um, you know, you have a floating weir um, in the water. Um, again, this is a specific gravity of, of over 1.25 as opposed to 1.0, so floating weirs are designed to operate in a 1.0 specific gravity solution. Um, 
as well as the design of the, the skimmer itself. So you're not, within that skimmer, with this solution, it's doubtful you're actually getting a cyclonic action within the body of the, of the skimmer. And then on top of it, your skimmer weir isn't functioning as it was designed. So, so there's just a lot of complications. Um, there is some skimming, strip skimming, and things like that. And there'll be, well, I'll show you some pictures here in a few minutes. Um, some, if not most, use non-NSF type filters. You'll see in some pictures coming up, they use very high quality equipment, but it does not look like what we're used to seeing in, in recreational water. Um, again, the, the system is designed to be light proof and sound proof. If one is claustrophobic, you don't have to close the door. Um, or you'll see pictures of there's some that they design, it's just an open tank. Um, so there, there's different ways to approach it. And they also want to be soundproof. Um, and, and that's all good, but when, when, when we're considering regulation, it's like, how soundproof is that? What if the fire alarm goes off in the facility? Is the person in that tank going to hear the fire alarm? Um, which was actually a real case in, in the UK not too long ago. Um, so there's, there's some, some different considerations we have to use. Could, um, advance, please. Okay, this is a, this is, um, I'm not promoting any manufacturers, please understand that. I'm just using some of their literature and I want to give them credit. This is a dream pod. Um, as you can see, it's eight and a half feet long and almost six feet wide. This is not a small piece of equipment. Um, and this doesn't include the pump and the filter and again, they call that, the industry calls that the engine, which is typically connected by umbilical cords and is set off to the side or maybe in a separate room. <clears throat> but again, this is not a small piece of equipment. It, um, they take up some space, but once you get inside, there's obviously there's soundproofing and insulation in this. So the inside space is smaller than the outside. But again, it's basically made for one person. Next, please. This is a drawing done by an engineer here licensed in the state of Washington. Um, these are not, you can see the little semi-oddly shaped pods there. These are not dream pods, so it's not the same as the previous picture, but it's a very, very, very similar system. So you can see what we look at for the engineer, show us the reception area, show us the, each pod room, how are you going to secure each one of those pod, or I'm sorry, float rooms, how are you going to secure the float rooms. We want a shower. We'd love to see a full functioning restroom in there, um, but that seemed a little bit, asking a little bit too much, but I, I Personally, I think it's a really good idea um, because if, if someone's in that tank for, you know, 90 to 120 minutes, um, if the urge, you know, hits them um, and they have to walk down the hall to the restroom, they're going to have to get out, shower, dry, clothe, walk to the restroom, come back, um, unclothe, shower, get back in. I have a feeling um, it's going to be a, a, a much more passive no, no pun intended, a much more passive uh, event um, that we might not know about. So again, the more convenient restrooms and hand washing facilities are, the better the chance we're going to keep our, our water quality at best, as the best we can. Um, again, you'll see in this drawing, um, washers, dryers, water heaters, mop sinks, um, and there's generally, this is called a hair station on this, um, but basically, you know, when somebody gets out, if they want to dry their hair, and there's somebody floating, you don't want them to hear the hair dryer. So, so again, there's a lot of soundproofing that goes on. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. <coughs> okay, this is um, a companion drawing for the previous one. This was also done by an um, engineer licensed here in the state of Washington, uh, Joe Dominchek, um, who is on our float tank guidance um, group in the state of Washington. But you can see here, this, this illustrates a lot of different things. This one actually has dual suction outlets, which is not really common in the manufactured systems that we've run into. Um, and you can kind of, you can see where the, the recirculation pump and the heater, and you can see, um, it's really small, but the, the sanitizer. Um, and you can see on the upper right-hand side of this drawing, you can see where the line goes through, and there's a little circle that says filter. Okay, this system, when it was purchased, it was, that was the filter, the one inside that pod. That was the entire filtration system, the engine, the filter, um, or the engine and the heater and the sanitizer were outside the unit. 
when we evaluated it, the filter media rate for NSF for 1.0 specific gravity water exceeded what this filter could do. So we had them put in an NSF cartridge filter to accommodate that. Um, again, some of these things are still in question, but that's why you see two filters on this system. The little circle one inside the pod is actually just an empty vessel. They just replumbed it. So basically there's no filter in there. It's just it's molded into the system so they couldn't do anything about it. They just sealed the, or put the cover on it and the water just runs through it. Um, so that's kind of the things we've been seeing, um, both from the facility design and then the individual tank design. Okay, next please. Um, here's another system. Now this one is even more condensed because if, if you look at this, this is a float away system. These are made in the UK. Um, nice systems, but there's some differences. Look, if you see the picture down there um, where the dancing Snoopy is, you can see the, the, the opening, even getting in there is a little bit different. So that's potentially going to change your air quality exchange when you open that door. Um, the vapor pressure inside is going to be higher. So that's a pretty good opening. It's going to, that's going to vent faster than like a Samadhi system where the, where the, where the door opening isn't quite as, as obvious. Um, but if you look at the schematic, everything is built into this little footprint. Before I, I mentioned that the, the filter and the pump and the heater and that thing might be connected by an umbilical cord um, to an external uh, engine. This one's all built in. So this system, if we had to modify a filter like we did in the previous example, now you're getting into you're going to have to change the manufacturing of that system, and you're going to have to be cutting holes in the side of it potentially to replumb things. There's still some question whether whether manufacturers' warranties would still be valid. So again, we definitely don't have all the answers, but we're, we're uh, aggregating a good pile of questions. Um, so please advance. Um, again, here's just some pictures. There's the dream pot again. Uh, the one in the lower left. Obviously, that's you know kind of uh, um, aesthetically pleasing, but I'm not sure how common it would be in a in a commercial center. Um, the one in the upper right, that's the open pod I was talking about. Um, that picture is actually from the Laureate Institute for Brain Research. Um, Dr. Feinstein is doing a lot of work with again PTSD and and you know uh, um, athletic rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation, that kind of thing. Um, so if someone's brand new to it and they don't like the claustrophobic thing, maybe this is an option. Um, we have yet to license one of one, these open systems in the state of Washington, but um, I really don't see a big problem with it as long as we can maintain water quality. The one in the lower right, <clears throat> again, that's showing two people. Um, it's doable, um, but rather than trying to, you know, eat the whole elephant at one time, we were trying to start, let's start with the basics. Let's start with one person and then we can try to extrapolate and see if we can extrapolate into multiple people. Um, and obviously that's an open system too. So, so there's still variations out there. The system in the center, um, I don't know if the engine is remote on that one, but that one's nice because you, uh, the, the patron has to walk through the shower to get in or out. So it's a pretty good reminder that, hey, they recommend this, it's a, it's a good sign. <clears throat> So again, if there's if there's questions, I can ask answer them later. But next, please. <clears throat> so this is another this is an isopod. As you can see, they look similar, but they're all they're all a little bit different. Um, you know, they ergonomically as well as functionality. But the, one of the reasons I put this in is isopod the urban float is in Seattle. They they've been established here for some time, but you can see the engine that comes with it. That's the picture on the right. You can see there's the, there's the, there's the pump, <clears throat> and then it goes, um, the water comes in, then goes up that pipe into that big silver tall vessel. That's the filter. Again, that's not an NSF cartridge filter. It's, a, it's basically a one micron sock that slips in there that is disposable. So when it starts getting clogged, you just replace the whole sock. Um, then it pro progresses from there to what looks like um, that lower, line on the right, the black box on top, I'm pretty sure is the heater. And if you look underneath that black box, it looks like there's another oversized mechanism. I'm reasonably sure that's UV. 
Um, but one of the reasons I put this in there is the little blue bottle that's sitting there. Um, I'm assuming, I can't tell, but I'm assuming that's peroxide. Again, in the state of Washington, once we found out from EPA that we can't do that, um, we will not license or allow the use of, of chlorine, bromine, or peroxide until we get further clarification from EPA. So that being said, we have to back up and use physical processes um, as outlined in the WAC, or the Model Aquatic Health Code, and um, by EPA, uh, physical means would include uh, ozone, uh, UV, advanced oxidation, potentially chlorine generators using salt, but the, the research that we've done, it really doesn't look like it's gonna work. Um, it's too much salt. A brine method, maybe, um, but, but again, th those, are, those are physical methods, and, and EPA will entertain those. So we've gone to physical methods only. Uh, let's see. You can see basically from that picture from Urban Float, um, it's a very simplistic design. Um, these are really, really messy systems. There's going to be salt everywhere. Um, so they want as little surface area to clean as possible. Um, so that there's not a lot of clutter. There's not a lot of trip hazards. But again, if the lights are off and you get out of there and it's dark, you don't want anything extra to trip over. So there's, there's considerations there. Um, so could you advance, please? Okay, this is, this is a combination of a bunch of different pump rooms. We'll start in the upper left. That's Float Lab. Um, Crash has a facility in California um, and has worked uh, closely with NSF on that one. Um, you can see it's a very nice system. That's really, really well put together. Easy to understand, reasonably easy to understand, um, and very easy to get at. Very, you know, it's a very well designed system. Um, and then you go to the upper, uh, the upper right, and you see see Float Fresno, and it's not quite as high tech, but again, it's reasonably easy to understand. You can see here though. They are using three NSF filters as opposed to the one uh, cartridge filter that came potentially with the system. So again, just slight deviations. The one in the lower left, um, again, this, the, well, these pictures are basically what, what the, in, the float industry calls the engine, um, which is typically the, the motor, the pump, the filter, um, the heater, and the, whatever sanitizing method is being used. So the one on the lower left, that would be what they call a pallet. So when you buy the pod, that, that thing arrives looking exactly like it looks in the picture. Um, the one on the upper right, Float Fresno, I have a feeling they put that one together themselves. Not saying one is better than the other, I'm just, just pointing out the differences. Um, the one in the center bottom is more likely what we're going to see in reality. <laughs> Um, where it's kind of put together, and one, one of my favorite things on, on this picture is, if you notice how the plug, the pump is plugged into an extension cord, um, and not only that, but the extension cord, its original female end must have failed, and they replaced it with a 99 cent uh, replacement from a hardware store, and I don't think that's going to meet electrical code, uh, but again, that's, that's reality. This is not a picture I took in Washington, so um, that's the one I found on the internet. So again, it's just different things to look for. Next, please. Um, okay, so, so I'm getting close to the end here. Um, I'm not sure where I'm out on time, but so some of the code considerations. Uh, you know, one, it's a very low bather load. Um, it's one person at a time, which might cycle eight or 10 people in a day, um, depending upon the facility. Um, so, you know, it's just a very low bather load. Um, and there's going to be more details about that um, in the future. But then there's the intermittent circulation. Again, this system is not running while the person is floating, um, or even in the tank, for that matter, because we don't want any uh, entrapment situations um, evolving. Um, you know, there's, there's a shower right there. So again, uh, in combination with the low bather load, Showers are very much promoted. Our, co our guidance in Washington requires uh, consumer notification of several different aspects, including shower before and after. 
um, you know, wash the, the oils and, and cosmetics and hair products from, from yourself before you get in that water. Um, and again, you'll want to when you get out or you, you're going to walk around looking like the, uh, like the Michelin man covered with salt or something. Um, this is a very slippery solution. Um, so surfaces that may have been okay in, in a traditional um, water recreation facility might not work. Um, it, because again, it, the, just by the physical pro, po, um, properties of the solution, is it, it's just very, very slippery. You can see in the picture on the left, it's a very high step over height. Um, so without a handle, that picture illustrates it pretty well. You know, what, if that person getting out of the tank loses their left leg, well, we don't have to talk about the re repercussions, but, um, you know, so, so we want handles out there so people aren't, aren't uh, um, slipping and falling. Um, again, referring the picture, in the state of Washington, this would be considered a general use facility. In the state of Washington, general use facilities require lifeguards. Um, obviously, that doesn't work in this situation. Uh, that's what part of the reason I picked the picture. Um, you know, the lifeguard is not going to sit there and watch you floating naked. And on top of it, you're floating naked in the complete dark, so they wouldn't be able to tell anyway. Um, so, so obviously, there's just some considerations we had to think of. Um, and I'm not saying we've got the final answers on all of them, but we've worked through quite a few. Um, ventilation. Um, and there's two, I, I want to address ventilation on two aspects. One is the room that the, that the float system is in, and then within the float system itself. Within the float system itself, there's a few that have active ventilation, but not many. Because again, if you have too much of an active circulation, you're going to create breezes and wind. So then when you're in that tank, um, you're going to feel those breezes and wind. Um, so generally, it's been passive from the tank to the room, but we do require um, a full uh, a HVAC or, or an exhaust fan type system to, to keep that room, um, to keep the humidity down. Um, physical characteristics of the solution, again, it's, it's a very, very different thing. Um, you know, I, I, I've done, I know this is going to sound weird and I'm easy to amuse, but if you take a two-liter bottle, I've done this, you take a two-liter bottle, fill it two-thirds with water, um, turn it upside down, you know, move it in a circle a little bit, and it's going to create a vortex and it's going to drain out of there and it's going to look like a tornado. Do that with this solution, it doesn't work. It, it's a different solution. There's different friction. You're not going to create the same vortex. So there's a lot of different physical considerations with the, with the solution over and above the chemical uh, problems. Another code consideration is these things are generally fairly less than a foot deep. Um, so if, if someone, you know, unless it's a seizure or drug or alcohol related or something like that, if it's, if it's a person, basically you sit up and, you know, your bottom is going to hit the bottom. Um, so you, you'd have the means or put your hands down, you'd be able to push yourself up. So it's not a deep solution. Um, again, pathogen exposure. Um, you get this stuff in your mouth and you know it. It's not something you're going to want to do twice. Um, you know, and if you have, I've, I've actually, I've floated in my, um, personally, um, I can speak from experience. Even if you, I, I just shaved and I went in there. And um, I probably should have waited. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have shaved that day. You know, if you have open source, you're going to know it. This is salty, salty water. Um, another big consideration is barriers. Uh, you know, traditionally, we've got self-closing, self-latching doors. But again, the nature of this therapy is, you know, it's not like the community pool where there's people running around so randomly, especially kids that could accidentally get in there. So we've, we've been looking very, very closely at what's appropriate for barriers given, given this new uh, modality, if you will. It's, 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 a, it's a new environment not we haven't really addressed with recreational water. Um, so not to belabor that too much, but we're definitely interested in talking to folks um, from all different perspectives to, to learn about all these different things. We've still got a lot to learn. Um, obviously, EPA has some issues. Um, NSF's got the CCS 12804 document. Um, the Float Tank Association has also been um, working with us actually very, very well, and we appreciate that. 
um, you know, back a couple of years ago when we first started kind of crossing paths, um, they invited us to discuss a little bit about their, the, the standards that they promote. And it's like, okay, let's, let's at least make sure we're all talking the same language. Um, so it's, it's actually been, it's been a very, very rewarding, albeit somewhat bloodied and bruised. Um, it's, been, it's been a really very, very interesting project. Um, and we're thrilled, again, to be allowed to, to share it with this group. Um, I think that's it. Um, would you advance? I think I'm at questions. Would you advance, please? Thanks, Paul. This is uh, Jason Kuntz here jumping in here for uh, oh. for to hear quickly. We really appreciate the uh, the webinar and any information. And as you were speaking, there were a number of of uh, chatting. I guess there was a chat session going back and forth where I think some of the questions that might come up, like around peroxide, for instance, did. And then you can scroll scroll back through that to see that. I would ask at this point in time uh, to direct the questions towards Paul. Uh, if you have any uh, that were not answered, you know, during the chat session, you know, or towards CDC or towards the Council for the Model Aquatic Health Code through the chat mechanism, and we'll try to keep up. There seems to be a lot of interest here today. And this, this Doug, Jason, before that, I mean, Kelsey, I think we had a couple slides just before we got into questions about what, what's going on with the CMAC, or just before I open that up. Uh, yes, CMAC, I can advance that for you. Okay. The uh, Council for Model Aquatic Health Code is in the process. We do have a work, uh, work group uh, that's put together to prepare a change request to add the design operational criteria for flotation tanks to the MAC, uh, including some, you know, the supporting annex material. Um, we want to get this in by the February 3rd deadline. Uh, next slide. So quickly, the, um, the um, work group is made up of, you know, we've got crash from Float Lab, Angela, Ikebosh, um, from BC Center for Disease Control, Ashton, um, Sung Cho from NSF, Bob Vincent, State of Florida, Paul Reeves, and Jason from CDC and Tracinda Davis. So that's our members. We've get, we're uh, in the process of developing the, um, the the MAC code content right now. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Paul and the rest for general questions then. Okay, I have one directed towards Paul here from Angela. It says, hi, Paul, thanks for the great presentation. Are you allowing O3 or UV as physical systems, or would it be O3 with UV? Ah, great question. Hey, Angela. <clears throat> you know, I was actually going to ask if I could get a copy of this, because that, that was like the only comment out of all of those that I was able to read. <laughs> it was the only one I got. Uh, great question, Angela. We, um, what, what, our co what our guidance right now says is you have to use a physical means um, which is ozone or peroxide, um, and then we go into um, the salt, again, it's questionable, but the, the, the chlorine generation and the advanced oxidation processes, or any combination of above. So we would allow O3 on its own, we would allow UV on its own, or we would allow a combination of the two. Does that answer the question? All right, while we're waiting for Angela to type here, uh, let's see, things are moving quicker. Let's try this one. Uh, also, what disinfectant methodologies are required that have a residual and measurable? Okay, so I take that back. There's a, there's a, there's a pre-comment a pre for that. It said from the same submitter. Any requirements by Washington uh, on on-site operational supervisor credentials, CPO, additional certifications, which is followed up? Also, what disinfectant methodologies are required that have a residual and are measurable? So uh, I think that's a two-part question. Okay, uh, the first one, State of Washington, <clears throat> much to my chagrin, sorry, um, we do not require any manner of certified pool operator or aquatic facility operator at any facility, including float tanks. So if that answers that part of the question, the residual thing, we're not allowing it, period, um, for, for, for a multitude of reasons, actually, but the biggest one is the EPA said we can't. Um, so, so I mean, we're not going to we're not going to violate federal law with our guidance. What we have to do is we've got to work with the, the tool set we've been given. Um, the other problem with that is we don't. I think that there's some ground being made here, but I'm going to make kind of a global statement. We don't know of any reliable test kit that can test what these residuals are. So we can say 
that, okay, you use chlorine and you can use it up to 10 parts per million, but there's no way to verify that. And my suspicion is facilities are using way more than they need, ergo, they're getting air quality issues. So again, we don't, we don't have any way to measure that, and it's EPA, not allowed by EPA, so we've got to stick with the um, with the physical methods or physical devices, devices, I'm sorry, that's what it's termed. Um, and to get back to, I think Angela has a follow-up about um, uh, the testing, we, we simply don't. Um, we're hoping to get more on the UV and ozone effectiveness, um, but again, it's gonna have to be done with this solution. Um, so we're, we're just waiting, but again, EPA looks at devices differently and they will allow them as opposed to the residuals. So we're, we're sticking with the devices only. Does that help? Okay, well, Angela's typing. We'll move on. Yes, it did. Thanks, Paul. So, okay. Lindsay, is there a concern with ozone off-gassing, especially in the enclosed pods? If so, would you require air monitoring of ozone in case it gets high enough to cause severe health effects? It is one of the most terrifying things <laughs> about this whole system. Um, when I started on this three years ago, I'm like, geez, ozone and closed space, not a good idea. But through Angela's um, input and several members of the Float Tank Association, it works. It really, really works. Um, so yes, it's a very big concern. Um, one of the things with ozone is, you know, we've got a pretty good grip on you know, what's the half-life in recreational water? We don't even have, we, we don't even know if the half-life of ozone, dissolved ozone, um, if the half-life is gonna be the same in this float solution. Maybe it's four times as long, we, we really don't know. Um, so yes, we are requiring some manner of monitoring. We kind of went back and forth. Where we're at right now is to have, a, a, to, to use a handheld monitor and have the person physically reach into the system when there's nobody in there, obviously, like right after your four turnovers, to reach in there and get a reading. We also talked about real-time testing where there's an actual probe that's mounted inside the cabin. Um, and I did find um, ozone monitors where there, you could buy one monitor and you could monitor at least three different uh, <coughs> pods or systems. But it's real-time. It's measuring all the time. Um, so you would be able to close the door to the system and you'd still be getting measurements of, of what that ozone is. Um, again, we didn't go quite that far at this point. We're just sticking with the, with the handheld ozone, but yes, it is absolutely a very big concern. So does that help? Lindsay, I think you said that. Lindsay, I think said that. Yeah, okay, great. So, so yes, it does. Paul, here's an EPA or environmental generated question. Do you require any notification of the emptying of, the, of that solution or the water into the municipal uh, drainage systems? Uh, that's a great question. <clears throat> yes and no. Um, what we require, um, and, uh, and I'll kind of give you a little bit of a backstory here too, but what we require is before we even permit a facility, we ask them, um, to get written verification from whoever's gonna be receiving their wastewater, we want written verification from that utility saying, yes, we can accept it. The backstory in that is we had one here locally, literally right in the town we live in, here where we exist in, where there was an inter, inter, interim treatment system that was a reed-based system. I don't remember exactly what the details were, but they would not accept the, the float solution. So that facility, we caught it before they opened, obviously. What that facility had to do was, was figure out a way to contract with a company that could come in and literally suck the water out of their tanks and bring it to a major utility. Usually if it's, if it's a big city utility, they can handle it. Um, but again, we want, we want verification that, you know, we're gonna be emptying this 200 gallon pod or however many pods they have, we're gonna be emptying it, you know, like every six months. So some utilities might say, okay, don't, don't empty them all at the same time. Maybe do them, you know, if you've got three pods, every two months, you know, stagger them so you're not inundating us with, with water. But yes, we do require some manner of notification. Thanks, Paul. And uh, to piggyback on that from Jason, are there, not, not this Jason, Jason Raven, Ravenscroft, are there recommendations on the frequency of water replacement? <clears throat> well, Yes, there are, and there are many of them. Um, 
you know, it, again, we, we, one of the things I would like to learn, um, and we're not going get to it, get it through our guidance, unfortunately. One thing I would like to learn is how does this water age throughout its life cycle? What happens? And if we could get regular testing, we'd be able to see how that's aging. But right now, um, basically, our, we're just going, you know, when the, when the water quality gets such that the clarity is bad, um, or as often as the manufacturer recommends, that's kind of the avenue we're taking. I know it's a little bit soft and nebulous, but um, again, we just we don't know for sure. And it's 800 pounds of salt is, you know, it's not cheap. Um, so we're trying to be sensitive to that and still protect people at the same time. Thanks, Paul. And right after that, what are the requirements in response to a fecal vomit incident? Uh, do you hyperchlorinate? What? That's an outstanding question. Um, oh, oh, actually, let me let me clarify something. So. Um, so, like I said, we cannot test for a residual. We, in a way, can't even test for effectiveness of UV and, and ozone just because we don't know the solution. So as, as our mitigation in the state of Washington, we're requiring biological testing after the fact. Um, so where did the question go? So basically, what are the requirements in response? So if, the, if we want notification, we, want, we as a health department or the local health jurisdiction, we want notification of what happened. We, and that will close that system, if not the facility, depending upon how you all license. <clears throat> but it would close that system. We would not, be, and we would be closing it because we got a, a bad biological sample back, right? <clears throat> so we would not reopen that until we get a clean biological sample. Again, it's not a foolproof system, but we're, 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 we're doing our best. So, to, so does that make sense? We're not, we're not being prescriptive on how you achieve it. You just have to achieve it. And we ask for how they did it. So again, we can start aggregating data for, you know, there was this kind of an incident. Um, they're using this UV machine and this ozone machine. They've got 168 gallons. They ran it for six hours, and they got a clean sample. Um, then when it comes down to third-party verification, then maybe the industry or uh, could come to NSF and say, okay, this is what we think we're doing. Can we verify this? So we're trying to work you know, from all avenues and help everybody, and hopefully we can work together, <laughs> industry, um, you know, consumers, uh, engineers, work together to come up with a, with a good solution that's not heavily weighted in, in one direction or the other, but it's still going to protect people. Okay, thanks, Paul. And what I'm going to do is combine a few questions here together. I'm going to try to get to everybody's, but uh, we're having great discussion here. Lindsay, I see what you asked about ozone, so we'll just hold for a second on that. Uh, so a question came in. If the salinity of the water is high enough to prevent growth of pathogenic organisms, why require ozone? Sorry if the question has already been asked. And, and before you ask that, then we had a couple questions coming in. What are the requ I'm sorry. Uh, do you require bacteria sampling, and have, in, have you determined the biological testing is valid? Does the salt impact the test results? So why, why require anything if the salt kills, to, to be simple here? Uh, do you require sampling, and is it valid? Okay. Um, if I lose track here, please correct me. Um, the salt does not kill. Um, it, does, it, it does some pathogens, but not all of them. Um, NSF verified in 2015 that, um, and actually it, it falls in with what Dr. Lilly published in 1977, Pseudomonas aeruginosa can survive. It's not super prolific, but, it, but this solution is not a bactericide for that. Um, it can survive up to 24 hours. So again, Pseudomonas, you're floating in the water, your ears are underwater, it's like a perfect gateway. Um, so, Slimity sampling. We do require um, monthly sampling from every system, um, and we're t testing for total coliform and uh, heterotrophic plate count. And I, sadly, I don't have, I see something in there for the actual numbers. I don't remember them, and I don't have it exactly in front of me. You all can send me emails, and, and we can get you squared away. And, and Paul, has that biological sampling been impacted at all by the, the salt? Does that impact the lab results? Well, now that's, uh, again, we, we simply don't know. Um, one thing to consider, one complication that we ran into late this summer was a lot of the water testing labs will not test this water. This is not, 
they, they are not uh, certified to test this type of water. So we actually had a hard time finding a lab that would actually do it. That being said, what we've been advised from the laboratory folks is that the salt, you know, because again, this is, it's a saturated solution at 94 and a half degrees. What do you do when you collect a sample? You cool it down. You're going you're gonna to show up at the lab with a cake of salt with a bunch of water over the top of it. Um, our, our input so far from the labs is that should be okay. The bacteria should still be in the water. Um, or they can heat that sample up and redissolve the solid. But again, we don't have any verifications from labs that exactly what works. So it's, it's kind of like we're, this whole guidance and everything, we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but you know, trying to trying to be as diligent as we can and you know, bypass hazards in the <laughs> that might might show up. But what we're this is a learning process, boy. I tell you what. Well, thanks, Paul, and we certainly understand that, and we appreciate you being willing to share you know what you've learned so far. And to back up here just for a second, uh, Lindsay asked, what concentration of ozone is recommended in float tank water? That's that's actually like that's what I was referring to. I don't have it right in front of me. Um, I know we have a 0.05 and a 0.01, but I don't remember exactly where those are located. So if, um, did you say Lindsay asked that? Yeah, my apologies. Um, oh. What's that? I said my apologies. I didn't realize you already asked the re response. Oh, no, no, that's cool. Um, but if, if you, uh, um, um, if she wants to, con if, she, if she or anybody wants to contact me directly, um, I think my, my contact information was on the first slide. Sure. And I, when Paul. I say me, I'm saying the program. We, I'm not working in a void here. We, um, June Nautska is a, a, my, my team member, and Dave, Dave Gifford is, is our supervisor. I'm not doing this in a void. They're all aware of what's going on. Uh, this is Doug Sackett, Paul, and uh, I think generally the, the upper limit of, you know, it's uh, the gaseous ozone could be less than the 0 0.1 parts per million. Um, so that's the, from a safety, the maximum, and then from how it's applied, that would get into more of the design and, you know, what, what efficacy you're looking for on, you know, specking out the system. But the maximum allowable is the 0 0.1, you know, in the air, which is obviously going to be affected by the, the concentration of water is going to affect what's in the air. Okay, that's, I noticed that in the, in the outline you sent this morning. Thank you, Doug. And we have one remainder question here, at least uh, uh, we still have a few minutes left. Have there been any illness complaints that you have dealt with? None. Um, in fact, you know, we're, we've been working closely with the industry for several years now, and um, there's never been a reported case of illness from this type of system. Um, I want to qualify that a little bit. In the, in the United Kingdom, there's been some incidents. Um, Actually, maybe it's not all in the UK, but in Europe in general. Um, I, I use the example of the, the burning building. That was a real example. Um, you know, the burning, the building kind of burned down around the pod. Um, not quite that graphically, but so it's like, okay, we've got to consider that. Um, there was also a death in the UK, but the person happened to ingest a horse tranquilizer right before they floated. So there was never any liability put on the float system at all. Um, it was it, it was an overdose basically, but other than that, no, we've we've never gotten any. You know, we've licensed probably, gosh, eighteen facilities in the state of Washington. We've never once gotten any manner of complaint. Other than we required chlorine, they didn't like that, but but other than that, no, no illness reporting whatsoever. Any other questions? It looks like we've got a couple people typing. Ocean floats. <clears throat> Pamela, if you'd be willing to Shoot me their website. That'd be awesome. I'd love to learn about them.
You're in Connecticut, Pamela? Have, have we talked before? I've talked to somebody in Connecticut. Cool. Thank you. It looks like we've got Thanks, in the chat box now. <laughs> okay, so it looks like Q&A has been wrapping up. Um, I wanted to thank you again, Paul, for joining us. This was a really, really great webinar, um, and thank you for fueling um, the conversations and discussions that we had today. This is really what um, we created the MAC Network for, so thank you. Thank you again. You are most welcome. I was, um, I was honored. <laughs> Um, so again, this recording will be posted to the NATO Max Network webpage, um, and it'll also be distributed to everybody that was registered. So please check your email for that. Um, and again, please join the Max Network, um, um, the Max Network listserv, so we can um, be in contact with everybody and make sure that you're aware of any upcoming webinars um, that we'll be holding in the future. Um, otherwise, everybody have a great um, afternoon or rest of your morning, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.